AP Biology, Chapter 36, Plant Transport, Part 1. Today we're going to learn about how things are moved around in plants. Consider that plants have to move water from the ground up hundreds of feet in some cases to where the leaves are to do photosynthesis. We also have to move things like sugars from the leaves back down to the roots and exchange gases in the leaves. Transport in plants. Here are some of the things that plants transport. We have water and minerals, sugars, and gas exchange. Water and minerals are transported via the xylem. And remember, xylem has two parts. There's uh, either the tracheids, which are thinner, and the vessel elements, which are uh, thicker. A way to help you remember that is the, the vet plays the xylophone. V for vessel, E for element, T for tracheids, and xylophone helps you remember, hopefully, xylem. Transpiration is a combination of three things, evaporation, adhesion, and cohesion. We're going to go into a little more details on this chapter. Negative pressure, that means there's a pull. In order to pull up that water, we're going to have a constant um, evaporation of water from the leaves, and that's going to create negative pressure. Sugars are transported in the phloem. Think phloem food, plant food is sugars, and this is uh, going to be a lot of sugars being moved, called bulk flow. The Calvin cycle, which produces the sugars in the leaves, loads sucrose into the phloem. Now, sucrose is a combination of fructose and glucose, and fructose is just a modified glucose. So all this stuff is being made from photosynthesis and the glucose that uh, results from it. This is going to be a push into the phloem, and that's going to be called positive pressure. So if the push, as in a case of sugars being packed into phloem, that's positive pressure. And we should write this down at this time, water, minerals, sugars. This is some basic information. And for transpiration, we have negative pressure. These are two things you have to know. I'm going to use my cursor then to kind of circle this stuff a couple times. Make sure you write that down. All right, gas exchange. Uh, we're talking carbon dioxide in, oxygen out. Of course, that's the, uh, the gases involved with photosynthesis. We need to get carbon for making our sugars, and then oxygen is a break, uh, waste product of the breakdown of water. This is going to happen through the stomates. Stomates, of course, are those little holes in the bottom of the leaves. And then we have cell respiration as well. Cell respiration is kind of the uh, almost the opposite of photosynthesis. We have to get oxygen in and CO2 out. Now, this is especially true in the roots. In the leaves, the photosynthesis provides the oxygen so much that uh, there's extra oxygen that leaves throughout this, the stomates and we use for our cell respiration. However, in the roots, there is no photosynthesis. So if there's no uh, air pockets or uh, aeration in the, the soil, then there's going to be a lot of uh, difficulty for the plant to get oxygen into the, the cells of the roots in order to keep the, the plant alive. In fact, this is the reason why we don't overwater our plants. If we put too much water in a plant, if they're not adapted for that extra water, uh, what ends up happening is that the oxygen um, doesn't get into the roots and then the root cells can't do cell respiration, and then the root cells die. Once those root cells die, the rest of the tree follows because there's no place for the sugars to go, it's not being supported, the roots are no longer taking up minerals like they should. Um, it just basically kills the tree, or the plant in general. So that's the reason why overwatering a plant kills it. You basically drown it. All right, moving on, we have uh, some physical forces that drive transport at different scales. At the very smallest of scales is the cellular scale, okay? So we're talking about from the environment into the actual cells of the plant. We're talking microscopic. Transport of water and solutes into the root hairs, which are also microscopic, then increase surf surface area. Then we have short distance transport from cell to cell, loading sugar from the uh, leaves into uh, the phloem sieve tubes. If you remember, the sieve tubes are kept alive by a companion cell, and phloem will take the sugars from the leaves down to the roots to be stored. And then we have long distance transport, uh, xylem and phloem throughout the whole plant. So getting from the leaves to the roots, that's the long distance part. Loading the sugars into the phloem, that would be short distance transport, and then going from cell to cell, or environment just to the plant cells, that's the cellular transport. And uh, we're going to go into each one of these processes as we uh, get to them. You don't have to write this one down, so you can, um, you can skip this one for now.
All right, this gets a little complicated. We're going to talk about this with some specific examples. Uh, you don't have to write this down, but uh, cellular transport, uh, there's a type called active transport, and you guys already know this. This is uh, something that requires energy. This is how we move solutes into plant cells. It's going to be active transport, and there's going to be a proton pump involved. So let's talk about how that works. What ends up happening is we have inside the cytoplasm of the plant cell, we have protons, and then we have a pump that pumps out the protons outside the cell. Now you might be asking yourself, what's the point of that? You're building up a concentration gradient of protons outside the cell. What are we going to do with those protons? Well, here we have um, the reason. Over here we have cation uptake and co-transport. Co means together. So what ends up happening after you pump out those hydrogen ions, the hydrogen ions are going to want to diffuse back into the cytoplasm, if they can, by chemiosmosis. Well, what ends up happening here is, as a result of this chemiosmosis um, of protons into the, uh, into the cytoplasm, into the plant cell, it's going to bring in, with it, nitrates. So the power is coming from the flow of hydrogen ions, and that power to change the shape of the protein allows nitrates to be brought in. So step one, pump out some protons. Step two, allow them to diffuse in with the nitrates that um, are needed by the plant. Over here we have kind of something similar. We have uh, protons being pumped out in the first step, and then we have the protons diffusing back in with uh, sulfur, or sucrose rather. And um, this is another way that the plant can get materials it needs. Pump out, flow in. Now over here we just have a normal active transport pump. So this one is just the uh, energy from ATP used directly to change the shape of the protein to pump potassium into the, the cytoplasm. But co-transport, we're going to talk about that later with the, uh, the stomates and how they open and close. And at that time, we'll take some notes on this. All right, short distance cell-to-cell -cell transport. Um, you do need to know uh, some of the stuff. We're going to go through each one of these in uh, turn. All right, so we have the cell wall. You guys know about that. That's metacellulose, chain of glucose. We have the cell membrane, which is a layer of bilayer of phospholipids that's semi-permeable. Some things can go through, some things can't. And then we have a vacuole, and that's a large central vacuole found in plant cells. So how do we move from cell to cell, uh, especially for water? Well, remember that we have these little holes in the cell wall called plasma desmata. That was from uh, chapter 7, I believe, on cell organelles and cell parts. We can actually move. Uh, through the cytoplasm. So if you take a look here, we've got cytoplasm, plasma desmata, cytoplasm. We can just go through just the cytoplasm to go from cell to cell. But there's also another way to move, and it's moving through the cell wall. This is called the apoplast route. The cell walls are all connected, and kind of think of them as like paper towels, which is what a paper towel is mainly made out of, is, is cellulose, which is the same stuff as, as a cell wall. If the water is hydrogen bonding to the cell wall and just kind of creeps along by adhesion and cohesion, then the water can just keep on moving along this, just the cell wall and never actually get inside the, uh, the cytoplasm. If you're moving through just a cytoplasm, that's called the symplast route. If we move through the cell walls, that's called the apoplast route. All right, now we do need to write this down and draw this uh, picture at the bottom. So we need to get all this in our notes. Circle it a couple times. All right, so moving water and solutes between cells. Now we're talking cell-to-cell -cell transfer of uh, solutes. There is a transmembrane route, and you need to know about each one of these. Trans means across. Membrane refers to the phospholipid bilayer. We're talking about going right across the plasma membranes. So the transmembrane route, we go from cytoplasm across the cell membrane, to the cytoplasm again, across another cell membrane, and back to the cytoplasm. This one is the slowest route, but you get the most control because the cell membrane can filter or control what comes in and out of the cell, and that's the transmembrane route. The symplast route is moving from cell to cell within the cytoplasm, the cytosol. Sim means the same, so we're going through the same cytoplasm from one cell to another. Here we have symplast. Cytoplasm, plasma desmata, cytoplasm, plasma desmata, cytoplasm. This is faster, but, um, but there's less control. 
And then the last one is the apoplast route, moving through the connected cell walls without even crossing the cell membrane, without actually going inside the cell. This is the fastest route. Imagine how fast it takes for water to wick along a paper towel, and uh, that's kind of what plants can do uh, from cell to cell. But the water never actually enters the cell. So here we have the apoplast route, represented in purple. Go ahead and uh, label that one. We have the symplast, the transmembrane, but the apoplast is cut off, so let's go and label this. And then the apoplast is um, just going along from cell wall to cell wall. So apoplast, fastest, through the cell walls. Symplast, through the cytoplasm, offers uh, less control, but uh, it's about medium speed. And then transmembrane, the most control, but you have to cross cell membranes, and it's the slowest. All right, moving on. All right, long distance transport, bulk flow. How do we move stuff um, from place to place? Well, it's driven by pressure, either negative or positive pressure. And at this time, if you don't have this in your notes, let's make sure we write this down. In xylem, tracheids, and vessels, there's negative pressure. Don't forget that. Pulling xylem uh, sap upward from the roots. So we got this constant pull driven by the evaporation of water, which allows more adhesion and cohesion. Uh, to occur at the top of the plant, which allows more water to be drawn up by negative pressure. Imagine it being pulled up to the leaves. The phloem sieve tubes have positive pressure. We're going to pack in by active transport sugars into the, uh, the tubes of phloem and push them throughout the plant and down to the roots. Positive pressure, a push for sugar and phloem. Xylem, negative pressure created by transpiration. This is for bulk flow or large amounts of stuff. All right, movement of water within uh, plants. We learned about this with water, uh, uh, water movement and um, water potential. Water relations in a plant cells are based on water potential. Osmosis through the aquaporins, water holes, aquaporins. Through the transport proteins allow lots of water to move. Now, water can move right across the cell membrane, but it moves through slowly. And remember that water flows from where it's more pure, higher water potential, to where it's less pure, lower water potential, or from hypotonic to hypertonic. When plants are put in a hypotonic or more pure water solution than the cells, then they become turgid. Turgid means stiff and internal pressure. If they're put in a, um, if the plants are put in a hypertonic solution, the water leaves the cells, and then the cells become flaccid in the cells, uh, the plant wilts. Flaccid means that it lost water and it feels like it's not um, turgid anymore or there's no pressure inside. All right, water and mineral uptake by the roots. Mineral uptake by the root hairs. Remember root hairs increase surface area and at the root hairs we have active transport pumps. Then this allows the plant to great, uh, concentrate solutes, things like nitrates, uh, quite a bit. It allows you to grab even more than just simple diffusion would allow you to get. Water uptake by the root hairs, the flow of high water potential to low water potential. We're talking about water moving from higher pressure, to, or higher concentration rather, to lower concentration. And this is causes root pressure. Now root pressure is just a little bit of push from water. But most of the reason why water moves up the plant is not due to root pressure. That's a secondary reason why water moves uh, through the plant. The primary reason is transpiration or the pull of water as a result of evaporation and cohesion and ad adhesion within the xylem. Let's go ahead and write this down. All right, remember dicots have their, uh, in the root, they have like a cross of xylem and phloem. They're getting the water from outside the plant. We're gonna talk about how that moves. In monocots, in the root, they have a ring of vascular bundles of xylem and phloem. All right, so let's talk about how this works. Let's go through the uh, symplast route first. We've got water moving in through by osmosis from high concentration to low concentration. And if it takes the symplast route, it enters into the cytoplasm, and then we go through the plasmodesmata, cytoplasm, plasmodesmata. And remember, this is called the symplast route. At this point here, we have to pass a uh, barrier. This purple thing is called the Casparian strip. And this doesn't really cause too much of a problem for the symplast route but uh, we're gonna talk about that with the apoplast route now. Eventually the symplast uh, route of water will reach a xylem, and then at the xylem, uh, in the center of the root of the plant, it will, uh, adhesion and cohesion kind of take over and bring it up to the uh, leaves. 
Here we have the apoplast route, and again, we have high to low concentration of water, osmosis, hypotonic to hypertonic. You can imagine if you put plants in salt water, the water would be more pure inside the plant, and the water would leave the plant, and that would eventually kill the plant. Don't salt your plants. All right, so we have apoplast route. We have uh, water moving in, and then it's just wicking along the cell wall by uh, hydrogen bonding all the way across. Now, at the point here where we have a Casparian strip, that, uh, that's impenetrable uh, even to the water. So what happens at the Casparian strip uh, toward the middle of the plant, uh, the root, the water leaves the apoplast, goes to the symplast, enters the cytoplasm, and then enters the xylem where adhesion and cohesion kind of take over to bring it up. Remember, apoplast is the fastest route for water. All right, let's go and write this down. Uh, endodermis, I'm not going to test you on. Uh, dermis means skin, endo means inside, so we're talking like an inside skin, if you want to think of it that way. Cell layer surrounding the vascular cylinder of the root. You do need to know about the Casparian strip, so write that down. We have a Casparian strip here that's impenetrable, other than the cytoplasm is not affected by it, but the cell wall itself is like a, uh, has that embedded within it. And um, we are going to force our fluid into the symplast route if we're an apoplast. It's kind of like a filtering mechanism. So for the symplast route that started symplast, you stay cytoplasm, plasma desmata right there, cytoplasm, plasma desmata, xylem. But for the apoplast, cell wall, cell wall, cell wall, oh, Casparian strip, it's going to force it into the symplast, into the cytoplasm, and then enters the xylem. X is like a filter. All right, here's another thing that you need to know. It's this white stuff. It looks like spider webs. When you uh, pull out some roots, you'll see this like white filamenty stuff. It's not spider webs. It's actually a fungus, and it's a good fungus. It's called mycorrhizae. Myco refers to being a fungus, and this is going to increase uh, absorption. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's a mutualistic relationship. It's not parasitic. It might have started as a parasitic relationship, but it's not anymore. Symbiotic fungi greatly increase surface area and absorption of water and minerals. We can increase the amount of uh, volume of uh, water, uh, basically, uh, that the plant can take up. So let's write that down. Mycorrhizae, a fungus, mutualism, increased surface area for water absorption. And that's what you need to know about mycorrhizae. Here we have some pictures of mycorrhizae. As you can see, they're actually in, uh, penetrating into the plant and actually are part of the uh, uh, cytoplasm of the plant here. It's actually kind of uh, uh, invading the plant, but it, it actually does a, a benefit to the plant by absorbing more water. The water wicks along the fungal hyphae and then are brought into the root hairs and eventually the plant itself. Here's uh, the mycorrhizae uh, is at the bottom here where the may apples are. All right, this ends part one of your notes on chapter 36, Plant Transport.